Zinski Kosterlitz to lose RAF to Kardar Parisi Chang RAF surfaces. So, Noriko, let's start. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairperson. I'll share my. Uh, and. Uh, Can you hear? I, I should yes, say I, I only see and hear nothing. Uh, no, hear nothing. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I hear everything, but I see everything, but hear. Oh, okay. Okay, I have to uh, check, share. Share something. We can hear. Yeah. So we, we, I hear you, but not not. I hear you. I hear you, but not from the from the movie, but from your uh, uh, connection. With yeah. Me. So that's the problem. And maybe you can speak. You can describe us what we are so, <laughs> what we're seeing. If, okay, okay. Because okay, sorry, okay. Because of the time. Uh, I I understand. So thank you, Chairperson. I'm Noriko Akutsu from Osaka, Japan. Can you hear? I I, I heard. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, Answer is yes. Uh, here is my outline. So in the introduction, I'll explain the aim of this presentation. Next, I'll explain the microscopic model. In sections three and four, uh, I'll, I'll show you our results. In section five, we'll share conclusions. For the surface or interface, uh, the surface uh, obeys the family basic scaling function. So W represents Surface width, L represents the size of system, T represents time. And these are exponents. Alpha is the roughness exponent, beta is the growth exponent, Z is the dynamic exponent. In the long time limit, the W uh, diverges when the system size L increases to infinity. A kinetic equation for a surface based on symmetry principle is Kada, Kada Parisi Zang equation. H is the height of the surface, and V0 is the mean uh, growth velocity, and nu is the surface tension related coefficient. Eta is the random force with white noise, and this term is the nonlinear term. For two-dimensional KPZ rough surface in three dimension, and the values of exponents are known like this. However, in the realistic crystal growth, the KPZ exponents are rarely observed. So, as the aim of this presentation, in the case of interface limited growth recession, the surface widths is studied on the restricted solid on solid model using the Monte Carlo method. Next, I'll explain the microscopic model. Uh, as a microscopic model, I we adapted our SOS model. Here, restricted means the height difference between nearest neighbor side is zero, is restricted to zero or plus minus one. Here is the energy Hamiltonian. The epsilon is microscopic ledge energy. Delta mu 
the driving force for clinical growth. Uh, delta mu is, is also expressed by the difference between the bulk chemical potentials of ambient phase and crystal. This is the top-down view of the business surface. The pink lines show surface depth. The surface is slightly tilted in the direction of 001 at 110. The square of surface width is calculated by the variance of mean surface height. This is the geometrical factor defined by the equation. Px and Py is uh, the xy component of the surface gradient. The average is taken over using the Monte Carlo method. Now we explain our result. The horizontal axis of these figures are absolute value of delta mu driving force. The, the vertical axis of upper figures shows squared widths over log L. The vertical axis of lower figure shows squared, no, no, uh, widths over L to the KPZ alpha. Max represents the system size. These figures are different from temperatures. The right figure, the temperature is higher than the roughening transition temperature of the 001 surface. The roughening transition belongs, is known to belongs to the brzezinski kosterich saules universality class. Comparing these figures, when absolute value of delta mu is small, the surface is BKD rough. Whereas when absolute value of delta mu is large, the surface is algebraic rough. There is a crossover point delta mu CO. As the temperature is higher, delta mu CO becomes larger. Next, we we'll explain the slope dependence of the surface width. The horizontal axis shows the tipping angle of the vicinal surface. The vertical axis of the upper figure is the squared width over log L. The vertical axis of the lower figure is the, is the surface width over L to the KPZ alpha. The blue marks and light blue marks stand for temperature at 0 0.4. Black marks and pink marks stand for uh, temperature at uh, 1.7. The, comparing these figure, figures, the slope dependence of W is expressed by two lines. The solid lines is expressed by this equation. When the tipping angle decreases, the squared width converges to zero because the 001 surface is smooth. The broken line uh, is expressed by this equation. Um, when the tipping angle decreases, the squared width converges to a finite value because the 001 surface is rough. This, these are the figures for non-equilibrium steady state. As expected, the, As expected, the marks are more agreeable than lower figure. The broken lines expressed by the equations. Uh, 
unexpectedly for small slope, the marks in the map upper figure are more agreeable. What does it mean? The 111 surface of the RSOS model is essentially different from the 001 surface. For visual surface around the 001 surface, the step grows this direction. A, ah, 001 surface forms terrace, and A is the ad atom, E is the ad hole. For visual surface around the 111 surface, the, the 111 surface becomes terraces. On the pink parts, uh, other atoms are forbidden due to RSOS restriction. On the green parts, other uh, holes are forbidden due to RSOS restriction. That is, there are no other atoms or other holes on the 111 surface. Therefore, multi-height clusters on the terrace created by two-dimensional new creation make the surface BKT lack. Here is our conclusion. A surface becomes KPZ rough when absolute value of delta mu is greater than delta mu CO. Although abyssinal surface is intrinsically KPZ rough, Multi-height clusters created by two-dimensional new creation makes the surface BKT rough. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, and thank you that you fit perfectly at time. Two minutes, but two, two minutes, but doesn't matter. So thank you very much. So now we have two minutes for questions. Two minutes. Uh, there is proposition for the audience. If somebody has question, um, maybe let's switch on the microphone or use the chat. Uh, let me, where is chat? Chat, I will look, three chats, excuse me, there are questions. Uh, uh, Francisca Peter to everyone. Uh, okay, excuse me, now this is technical sound, we can, uh, what about questions? So, okay, maybe I... Maybe question. I um, Question. Okay. Is this? Uh, I mean, the, this um, BKT uh, class. You say the height square grows like log L square. If I saw this correctly on one of your first slides. So this would Last be the right. same class as the uh, quenched uh, um, sign uh, random face sign Gordon model. Mm. Uh. The Professor Takeuchi asked me similar questions, but I think it's the average, the average is taken over a very, uh, two to the 10, two times 10 to the eighth Monte Carlo step by side. So uh, the results show the very long time result. So, I, I'd rather think not so. Uh, mm, so del around the delta mu, but I think that it's BKT rough, not EW rough. Yeah, but the so, percent class is very similar. Sorry that I must interrupt you at the moment. We have no time for more questions. Oh, no. So okay. I invite you to okay. personal discussions. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Once thank more. You very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Noriko. Thank you. So the second the second speaker, the second speaker is Professor K. Wiese uh, from from uh, Phys Phys theoretical physics laboratory Paris and the title and the title of his talk is loop erased random walks 
charge density waves, phi to power four theory, and the Abelian sand pile map. So let's start, Professor. Okay, we'll put on the movie. Hopefully you hear me. Yeah. Thanks uh, okay. for this nice uh, invitation to give a talk at this interesting conference. Today, I would like to report on a joint work with uh, Andrei Fedorenko, Asaf Shapira, and Mikhail uh, Kompanyets on looperized random walks and their various uh, relations, especially to 5 4 theory. So, what is a a loop erased uh, random walk. Here to the left, you see a random walk, which the traces are given in uh, uh, blue and uh, pink. And you see that uh, whenever the, the blue trace hits back onto itself, makes a loop, this loop is erased. What is uh, remaining is called a loop erased random walk. Objects of interest you want uh, to look at are its radius of duration. By construction, since it's uh, constructed from a, a random walk, the end-to-end -end distance scales with the number of steps n, like n to the 1 over 2, 2 being the fractal dimension of a random walk. On the other hand, it scales like the uh, length of the loop arrest random walk here in uh, blue to a different power 1 over z and z is a fractal dimension of the loop erased uh, random walk which is 5 over 4 in two dimensions and 1.62 in three dimensions. So how can we uh, construct a uh, field theory uh, for this? And there are two steps in the construction. The first is a combinatorial assessment of uh, propagators on a of an, on an arbitrary graph, and uh, to 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 get the idea of how this works, I uh, just show the simplest possible or well, simplest graph on which I can explain the idea. So it's a graph which has three uh, uh, nodes A, B, and C, and there I have a problem are, with my laptop probabilities uh, uh, involved to go between these uh, uh, these nodes according uh, to the errors. So I always start at A, go to B, and then uh, to C. But in between, I can make loops at uh, B, and I can make an arbitrary number of loops. All of them, after loop erasure, will give the same loop erasure and a walk in blue. And the, the weight of the loop erased random walk uh, gamma, so the blue curve here, is given by this formula. So this geometric sum here. Now, how can I sum such a geometric sum? Well, I have to multiply it with one minus the weight to make a loop, which is uh, uh, given uh, here. Now, what is this object uh, with which I multiplied? Was well, nothing but the fermion partition function on this graph, fermion, because there is this minus sign. And we know if you make a loop in fermions, you get this factor of, uh, of minus one. <clears throat> and what comes out when I do this multiplication, of course, all higher um, terms will cancel. And the only thing which remains is the first term, which you can also recognize as a fermionic object, namely the fermion propagator on the graph. Note that the fermion propagator can never go twice for the same um, vertex because this would uh, imply that in the generating function, I have a field, a fermionic field uh, twice and the square of a fermionic, fermionic field always equals zero. Now, the theorem which I have just tried to motivate to you and which actually can be proven is that the product uh, written here, so P of gamma, so this line times a, a partition function is in all cases A of gamma, given here 
its formal uh, definition. <clears throat> now we can check one more case if I add to the graph some disconnected part. Well, I will get a, a factor like this for this additional uh, part and it will contribute both to Z as to the fermion um, propagator. So still this relation will be um, valid. There is a second element uh, to consider because I want to detect whether my um, my loop erase random walk goes through a given point and I don't want to sum this over the loop erase random walk and all these uh, loops here. In order to achieve this, I need more fields. But the theory, I mean, the expectation values I already calculated for you are not changed by adding uh, one boson and one fermion with the same um, action to uh, the uh, theory because every bosonic loop counts plus one and every fermionic loop counts with a factor of minus one. So they, the additional degrees of freedom will always cancel in the perturbation expansion. <clears throat> so what I should write down is um, e to the minus X, S as being the lattice action uh, and the lattice action I, I construct such that there are from each vertex X, there is an outgoing um, line uh, with an amplitude beta X, Y. Now, of course, what I have to construct is the lattice action. So I, take, I have to take the log of this uh, line. And what I will get is a log of this expression. And as a standard in field theory, when the field phi um, I should mention this is a four minus epsilon expansion. So the field phi is expected to have um, scaling dimension, uh, which makes such that higher powers in, in phi are less relevant. So I, I should uh, do a polynomial expansion and see what I get. So the leading order terms, which I have to keep all, are quadratic in, in the field. And they're given by this uh, formula here. The first one is a number and it becomes a number if, if I make uh, all this uh, translational variant. So it does not depend on, uh, on X. <clears throat> and the second can be recognized as the lattice Laplacian. The subleading term, well, the leading subleading term is a quadratic term from this expansion and it's a square of this object. And again, if I only keep here the leading term I will get this object here with uh, this expression as well. We as something we recognize as the coupling constant of this phi four theory or phi four type theory because in my phi four theory I have now put two fermions and uh, one boson. But again, the the phi four interaction is uh, coupling only to to the density, and this allows me to use the same trick. Uh, I can replace n bosons by minus n uh, fermions. So I can see this as a uh, two fermions and one boson or minus one complex boson. Uh, now I have to, to do uh, analytic uh, continuation. So I have to calculate for an arbitrary number of bosons and then they end do the analytic uh, continuation to the to minus, to minus one complex bosons. Or I can also use uh, minus two uh, real bosons. And this is a standard counting in phi four theory. So I got phi four theory with uh, minus two uh, for the number of uh, components. So let's put this to a test and see what uh, I get. So the um, prediction for fractal dimensions and dimensions two and three uh, are given here. So these are six loop results obtained together with Michael Com, uh, Companiets. And you can compare this to numerical simulations uh, and it works even in two dimensions where the expansion parameter is large, but it works extraordinarily for the case where we have no analytic result in uh, namely uh, three dimensions. 
So this is a very nice equivalence, but actually there are more interesting equivalences here. So what I've shown you up to now is this, um, this corner here. Let's now focus on, on this corner here. So there are charge density waves, which I claim are also equivalent to the same theory of two or fermions on one boson. <clears throat> so charge density waves are disordered systems and disordered systems, here you see the Martin C. Rose formulation, they will always appear in the disorder correlator between these uh, two, um, um, the, between these two uh, uh, fields now written at two different times. So it's a difference between these uh, two copies. Second information I have to put in is that the fixed point under RG is uh, uh, simply a parabola, a shifted parabola, which leads me to this interacting uh, term here. And you see the center of mass does not appear in the interaction. Now I can translate this to a supersymmetry uh, formulation where I will pick up two additional uh, fermions. But what I said before that the center of mass does not intervene on the interacting part of the theory uh, remains uh, true. So what I end up is uh, essentially the yellow um, terms here and you recognize it's again a 5 4 theory with uh, one bosonic and two fermionic uh, degrees of freedom so it's the same theory i talked about before now so the time diagram is going you here too quickly contains many more uh, relations so there are laplacian walks or learning circuits uniform spanning trees the abelian sent by model and the pots model in the limit of q uh, to zero. I will not be able to uh, to explain this, of course, in the remaining time. So let me just thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for your intensive talk. Thank you very much. And now time we have two minutes for for questions. So maybe somebody would like to put question on the chat or. So uh, maybe a simple question, if what is a physical background uh, for this kind of random walk and what is the relation this walk to self-avoiding random walk? There is some relations or uh, could you say in few words? Okay, Ms. Professor Wiese. Oh, I'm sorry. I heard not, nothing. Yeah, what I is think going? we lost him. We lost him. Ah. He's on mute. Now, no, no, I, I have my microphone is switched on. So no, you're no, okay. No. You're okay. Now you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Now we hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, Luberized random walks and uh, uh, self avoiding walks, they. Um, sample the same uh, configurations, but the measure is different on both of them. So a loop arrays the measure is different, are, yeah. are, are, I mean, uh, are farther stretched out. So they are, I mean, they have and a smaller so what about dimension. I see, I see, I see. Path probability method is also somehow related to your, um, is possible to treat uh, or, or is, is, this better is the diagrammatic best is this diagrammatic method okay we have no time to to discussion but it's very it's very interesting talk at least for me so again thank thank you thank you very much because we May have I no time very quick question just a very quick question yeah the q go to going to zero correspond to the spanning trees so how is it related to the loopless random walk yeah, so the uniform spanning trees are sitting up here. So if you take a uniform spanning tree and you take uh, two uh, points on this uni uniform spanning tree, okay. there's a, a unique shortest uh, connection and this unique shortest connection is a Luberized random walk. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I got yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, speaker. Thank you again. That's for me. And now, now, 
we have uh, we have Professor Juan Luis Cabrera from uh, Tech. Hello, yeah, you are here. Ah, nice. From Technical University of Madrid or Polytechnic, yeah, this right, equivalent. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, the, oh, I'm going to share my screen. This uh, is already, uh, uh, a recorder. So, Michael, you should please help help us how can, to share the it? screen. And the title, maybe I press. The title is, as everybody, hopefully everybody see, I say, an analytical structure for turbulent cascades from, from a 2D discrete map. So let's start, Professor. Thanks. I think we can't hear him. You can't? When you share your screen, you should also share sound. There is a checkbox. OK, thanks. Sorry, I forgot that. Just a second. What is it? Yes, that's the one. Okay, let me start by the beginning. Just a second. Now, this is an analytical structure for trouble and cascades from yes, the discrete map. This is a work done with my collaborator Esther Gutierrez and Miguel Rodriguez. Turbulence remains an exciting open problem. It is uh, an open problem basically unsolved from a theoretical point of view. Uh, while it is uh, an ubiquitous phenomenon, both in natural and technological uh, realms. Commonly, we relate the word turbulence to fluids. That word comes from the Latin turbulentia, meaning trouble, disquiet. So, turbulence, uh, as, as we know, we can see some example here where we show a fluid after passing a curved wall or a turbulence in a river rapids. In fully developed turbulence, energy cascades from larger to smaller scales, obeying a power law characterized by an exponent minus five over three, which was derived by Kolmogorov. Uh, the idea of cascades is due to Richardson. That's uh, an idea that uh, um, says that nonlinearity transforms the large scale uh, velocity circulations into circulations at successively small scales until they reach such a small scales that the circulation of the eddies is um, efficiently dissipated into heat by viscosity. Even so, we don't have a detailed analytical description of such a cascade process. Turbulence is also characterized by having a strong in intermittency in the velocity in the velocity field. So as we show here for four different situations, experimental situations. But intermittency is not exclusive of turbulence. It can be found in very diverse situations as in human stick balancing or in econophysics in the standard board index or in epileptic uh, uh, scissors or in a speed wave instability. So uh, question, the one we, we ask ourselves is whether we can say something about cascades analyzing simple intermittent system. For that, we took the delayed regulation model, a random stochastic version of the delayed regulation model, where uh, we have a parameter R, which is uh, a fluctuating 
uh, random perturbation with an intensity A and a bias B. That system, the deterministic version of the system, has a, a bifurcation diagram as the one we show here with a zero fixed point when the control parameter is between zero and one, and one minus one over R when the control parameter is between one and two, and with a half bifurcation in the value two. Uh, when the, we are uh, close to that hobbification and the parameter fluctuates uh, stochastically, we have on off intermittency. So we work with that system and we uh, wrote down that system in a, in a dimensional uh, uh, way, uh, showing the state space as a vector which propagates with the matrix A. Uh, plus a certain bias when we linearize uh, the system around the point 1 minus 1 over R, the mean value of R. We are going to call alpha that value and beta the mean value of R. So the system can be written down as following this equation and <coughs> that equation can be expanded so it can be expressed as a function of the initial state plus some additional budget term. This uh, expression can be compacted a bit after some careful manipulation and that uh, expression can be uh, compacted even more so we can ex express the state of the system as the a product uh, applied to the initial uh, state. Uh, details about this calculation can be found in a preprint already in, available in the archive. So we want to know how, how is the behavior of the norm of the, of the uh, system states and that norm depends on the product of the, the, the product itself which uh, has the information of the evolution matrices. So uh, solving that uh, product or, uh, is, is, is not uh, uh, straightforward. So what we do is we analyze the behavior of each of the inner products. For example, we here have P1, the first inner product. This P1 has these eigenvalues this is structure for the values, which is characterizes both um, such a lambda, which is a, a quadratic a, equation in the noise term. And we can see that the second inner product is also has eigenvalues with the same form, where it, the value lambda is also a quadratic equation in, on, in the noise term, but we can see that the coefficient of this equation are also quadratic equations in the, in the noise term. So that's going to be the rule for all the eigenvalues. And in particular, we can see that the capital lambda behaves always as quadratic equation in the noise term where each of the coefficients are also quadratic equation in the noise term. That's true. We can say it for lambda three, but big lambda three, capital lambda three, but also for capital lambda four and for capital lambda five. So it is possible to generate a function, to calculate a function that is able to generate all the, the big lambda. But first we have to recall that these capital lambdas are the leading term uh, uh, of the eigenvalues that determine the norm of the system states. Also, that these capital lambda are formed by order two polynomial whose coefficients are order two polynomials and so on. <coughs> so in general, if we know the two initial, the, the initial states lambda one and lambda two, we can obtain any capital lambda G given that at the generation g minus 1, if we have 
a term in the in the noise term uh, uh, to the power of k. So in the next generation, it generates a, a new term uh, in the in the in the same order of the noise with uh, this uh, shape. So a way of seeing how this evolved is plotting uh, in a tree representation the coefficient. So you can see here the coefficient for the big capital lambda one, here the coefficients for the capital lambda two, and here the coefficient for the capital lambda three. So uh, this process can be uh, taken further and being represented in this plane. So we take the, the unit interval from 0 to 1 and divide the interval in three subintervals of the same length and on the, those subintervals place the value of the coefficients C2, C1 and C0. So after one iteration each subinterval is divided itself uh, in new three subintervals, and we can place in these new subintervals the new coefficients and repeat the process to uh, ahead a number of iterations. Here you can see the results after 15 iterations, okay? And the result is, uh, is that successive enlargement of the initial interval show a statistical equivalent object. So we obtain a fractal. We can see how's the fine structure of this fractal. This behavior can be seen in the intensities, in the magnitude of each of those points. We can see that it's an, an non-cell similar object. So our question is whether we can relate a main changing quantity as this intensity with a main changing quantity in turbulent cascades. For example, the energy, can we find a relationship between the energy as a function of the weight number and uh, some energy defined as a function of g of the level of uh, iteration? So to do that, we we have to, we, the, we, we define an energy which is uh, I, I, mm, the same as the inverse of the summation of, of all the uh, values, uh, the, the, the positive values of the intensity. And uh, uh, we can see that when the parameter is close to the whole bifurcation, we can obtain this expected scaling for turbulent cascades. And because of this, we identify L of G the number of non-zero intensity at the scale G with the wave number. So summarizing, so we have found the expected law for turbulent cascade. We identified L of G with K. That scaling law is found where the parameter is close to the hub bifurcation. We expect that the cascade will continue without end. Uh, we expect preliminary results to show the patterns for the power law when the noise is on and we expect that this to have application to accelerate the computing simulation of turbulence. Thanks a lot for listening to us. Bye. So question, please. Anyone? If you take this as a model for turbulence, I mean, there should be a difference between two and three dimensional turbulence. How does it show up in your system? Well, it's, it's not a model for turbulence. There is not a, a, a drop of liquid here. It's, it's, it's a map coming from, a toy map coming from population dynamics. So uh, the point is whether there is some connection other than the fact that you can get the, 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 power, the power law. So, I mean, there is no obvious relation it's still uh, how to connect this map with the fluid or to any kind of turbulence. So perhaps, I don't know, I'm trying to think in that, 
already. So uh, the fact that we have, for example, uh, the behavior of the of the of the power law with the with the with the number of uh, of non uh, zero uh, intensities so make me think that probably we may we may breach even more uh, the results uh, same than each of the of the of the values uh, that appear in the fractal are in some way related with uh, with the with the with the key I mean, let me show you this. So maybe, maybe uh, connecting this this key, these intensities with the specific uh, is the spinning uh, uh, of the of the in the in the, in a, the hypothetic fluids. Uh, maybe that uh, 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 take you to turbulence. But after that. Uh, uh, going to two or three dimension is not is not something obvious thank you you're welcome Dr. Kutner, do you hear us? Hello? Looks like we lost him. <laughs> okay. It's uh, time for Dr. For Daniel Tegel. I well, think. Th th thanks a lot. <clears throat> uh, uh, welcome yeah. the next one. Yes, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. You can share your screen, uh, Dr. Jekyll. Yes. Um, perfect. Right. So, um, hi, everybody. Um, it's uh, 7.22 Arizona time here, and the sunrise is at 7. 21, so it's a pleasure to give my first sunrise talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about non-extensivity. In particular, I'm going to focus on macroscopic quantities characterizing non-extensivity. And uh, we'll see how they relate to each other. So um, I will summarize two papers. Uh, these are the two papers um, here. Um, and I will focus on five concepts. One is generalized entropy, and the other is configuration space scaling. I will explain all these in detail. The third one is density of states. The fifth one is a, an exponent uh, characterizing non-extensivity through generalized entropies um, that was introduced by Hannah and Turner. And the fifth one is uh, anomalous diffusion scaling, which is, which is a characteristic of uh, a diffusive process. So we will see how all these different macroscopic uh, concepts related to uh, non-extensivity and song correlations relate to each other. Uh, I also have to say that uh, two very good books introducing uh, generalized entropies and, and this uh, topic uh, to me are these two. So one is uh, their introduction to the theory of complex systems. This is a recent book by uh, Turner, Hannah, and Klimek. Um, there is a wonderful chapter about generalized entropies and their work in the last 10 years, so I, I highly recommend that. And the other one is maybe even more well known is the introduction to non-extensive statistical analysis by Tsalis, uh, which, which is also a really nice book uh, 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 pointing at all these different aspects of strong correlations, uh, history dependence, and non-extensivity. Um, so, Configuration space scaling is simply uh, the relationship between the number of variables and uh, the number of possible configurations uh, of the system. So as the number of, as we add more and more variables, we can see 
how the number of configurations uh, change or scale with this number of uh, variables. And if uh, the variables are independent, then this configuration space thing is exponential. Uh, but if they have strong correlations between them, or for any other reason, because some aspect of the configuration space is restricted, uh, it, uh, this scaling can be sub exponential. Um, now, another concept here is uh, generalized entropies. Um, it can be introduced in many different ways, but um, um, I, I will not have time to get into that now. Uh, but let's just see examples. So uh, these are some examples. This is a nice collection from this paper. This table is actually from our paper, but the collection is from, from that, uh, that paper. Uh, we, we see uh, the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy over there, the Tsalis entropy, but many, many generalized entropies can be written in this uh, sum over point-wise function over, over the probabilities. Uh, as it is depicted here, a uh, famous uh, exception is Rainy entropy, which is uh, a log of a sum of, of the of, uh, function of probabilities. So, so this is generalized entropies. And so the question is, can we relate these two? Um, and if yes, what's the relation between these two? So the idea is that we want the entropy to be extensive. So we want the entropy to be extensive. We want the entropy to scale as the number of variables because we want a measure of uh, a pair variable degeneracy, right? Uh, we want to uh, compare it, let's say, with, uh, with energy. We want to have meaningful thermodynamical infinite system size limits. So we want the entropy to uh, be extensive. And so that gives a prescription on our relationship between this configuration space scaling in generalized entropies. And this can be nicely characterized by this exponent C here. So what happens is that, we, is that uh, this exponent C measures how the generalized entropy rescales uh, uh, re when the configuration space is rescaled, right? Uh, so this generalized entropy is the, is the extensive entropy of the system. So this is, uh, to this relationship, this, this C exponent measures uh, how far away the uh, the system is from 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 independent and uh, so but what is its uh, non extensivity class and so what we ask here is uh, oh here there are the c exponents to the uh, uh, associated to uh, the different entropies so for example the boltzmann gibbs entropy the c exponent 1 uh, the thales entropy which has a parameter q in it has a c exponent q and then we can see all these uh, other uh, generalized entropies and the, the C exponent. Um, now, what we asked is what happens if the visiting probabilities of configurations are non-uniform? So a non-uniform visiting probability in this language of the density of states, uh, which is the probability density function over these visiting probabilities, so a uniform uh, visiting probability would correspond to a, a delta function at uh, one over w, where w is the configuration space size. Um, but we can imagine a, a various other um, uh, density of states uh, where the, where the uh, visiting probabilities are very far from uh, homo uh, homogeneous, very far from uniform. So the question is, does this change the extensive entropy of the system? Um, and if yes, how? So can we, can we uh, formalize the theory uh, already? So do, do non-uniform visiting probabilities change the extensive entropy of the system? So this is the question. The answer is they do. So first of all, if we have a parallel density of states with an exponent that is just, uh, uh, which, is, which, which is minus one plus epsilon, where epsilon scales as one over W, uh, it turns out that there is no extensive entropy uh, that can be associated to, to such a system. Not even the boltzmann gibbs entropy is extensive, which we found really interesting because we might expect that the boltzmann gibbs entropy at least is always extensive. Um, for a log normal density of states, uh, uh, we, we find that, that a different Salis entropy is extensive 
than if the density of states would be uh, uniform, it would be this direct data. Um, so here we, we depict that. And so what we can do is that uh, we can uh, look at the Boltzmann Gibbs entropy, for example, and, uh, and see whether different density of states, uh, which is uh, the inhomogeneity uh, of the visiting probabilities uh, over configuration space, um, if the Boltzmann gives entropy will be, be belong to a different uh, uh, non-extensivity class um, if we change uh, this, this density of states from the microcanonical, which is this direct data, to something else, right? And so um, we, can, we can analytically calculate um, for all these many density, different density of states, we can see that uh, turns out that the entropy, this board, although it's a, the a Boltzmann Gibbs entropy, doesn't always scale as the log of the system. And corresponding to, correspondingly, the, uh, uh, the configuration space doesn't even, uh, doesn't always scale exponentially uh, with the number of variables. Um, and the C exponent is uh, a, a different C exponent uh, than if the, the, the system uh, or the visiting probabilities were uniform. And so we can do this, the same thing for Tsalis entropies. Um, and, and, and we see a whole uh, variety of different behaviors, which we found really interesting because we didn't really expect that uh, 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 all these density of states that are not extremely in, uh, uh, skewed can really alter the behavior, but they can. Um, so to sum up the, a better picture is that uh, generalized entropy is related to configuration space scaling, uh, to extensivity, but uh, we really have to scale in the, uh, the density of states, the, the non-homogeneous uh, uh, visiting probabilities if we encounter with such a system. Um, so uh, the detailed calculations are all in this paper and uh, also uh, this uh, roadmap of, of how to calculate the different uh, uh, quantities. Now, um, so this is non-extensivity, but non-extensivity is a consequence of strong dependence between elements. Now, another consequence of strong dependence between elements is, is, is uh, a collective stochastic dynamics uh, and how they differ from ordinary uh, diffusive processes. So we model this as a 1D nonlinear for Kaplan equation. So uh, in the diffusive term, instead of uh, having a simple uh, uh, diffusing term, we introduce a nonlinear transformation, a simple nonlinear function of the density in the diffusive term. So this is the, the, the kind of the simplest way of modeling uh, interaction between particles in, in, in this microscopic uh, uh, dynamical setting. And so, um, so the question is, if these two, Phenomena, non extensivity and, and uh, uh, collective stochastic dynamics are both the consequences of strong dependence between elements. Is there any relation between them? And so we use the tool of generalized entropies to uh, connect these two. And we assume that the maximum entropy distribution is the stationary distribution of this Fokker Planck equation. So this is the relationship. And so if one assumes that, um, if one assumes that um, one can try to relate these two uh, qualitatively very different uh, processes. And uh, in particular, we measure the de deviation from ordinary diffusion to this uh, anomalous diffusion scaling, uh, which is simply uh, a measure of dispersion, right? So how, let's say the standard deviation or any measure that is uh, that, uh, uh, has the unit of uh, the same unit as, as the space uh, spreads over time. And so we try to relate this exponent C, which is characteristic to the non-extensivity class of the system and this exponent gamma, which is this anomalous diffusion scaling. And so if we do that for the Boltzmann Gibbs entropy, uh, we find this capital lambda here, it's the inverse of the maximum entropy distribution, right? So it's, it's, it's a log function. And so we can calculate the corresponding uh, non 
gen generally speaking, nonlinear Fourier concatenation. Uh, uh, here I only show the, the version without uh, external potential uh, for simplicity. And then one can calculate the, the exponent C and an exponent gamma. And as we already saw, the exponent C is one for the Boltzmann Gibbs entropy. And as maybe as, as, as is well known, um, the exponent gamma uh, is, is one half for uh, uh, this uh, uh, the ordinary for plantation, linear for plantation. Now, what happens if we switch to Salis entropy? If we switch to Salis entropy, we see that, uh, that uh, the inverse of the maximum entropy distribution is a different uh, function. Uh, the the, the Fokker-Planck equation associated to that becomes nonlinear, and in particular has this form, as it has been discussed uh, uh, many times in literature. And so it has a, uh, an exponent gamma equals this uh, expression 1 over 1 plus q. Uh, so we asked if there is a general relation between C and gamma. And so what one can do is that one can uh, uh, evaluate the C and Q for all these different entropies uh, to this inverse of the, of the uh, maximum entropy distribution and then calculating the, this generalized for Kaplan equation. And so what turns out is that this relationship in the C and gamma always holds. Um, and so, um, we, we, we found that really interesting. And so to sum up, uh, this is a really, this is the C and gamma characterizes uh, the, uh, the non-extensivity class of the system on the one hand and the, uh, the, the uh, anomalous diffusion uh, on the other hand, both are the consequence of strong dependence between, between the variables. Um, and here are the populations, uh, are all, the uh, different populations are all in this paper. Um, and with that, I would like to thank the collaborators, especially uh, Shamu Balog, who did many of the advanced calcula uh, calculations, and uh, uh, also uh, the, the funding agencies. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this brilliant talk. So the, now time, I think, one or two minutes for, for some questions or somebody. Oh, I have questions, but <laughs> another maybe another person also. I have one question. question. Yeah, but uh, please louder. Oh, uh, can you hear me, Chairman? Uh, I hear you. Yes. Oh, so, uh, I, have you some question? I, ha I have one question. Yes. Uh, you start. Okay. With... Okay. Let's let's put. Oh, thank you. Slowly uh, you put study... your question. Uh, nonlinear Fokker Planck equations, right? So, uh, and, well, you refer to them as stochastic dynamics. So, for the, say, for the linear one, I agree with that in the sense that there is a theorem that says that if you have an Ito stochastic differential equation, the probability distribution function of the uh, stochastic process that solves this SDE is described uh, with a Fokker Planck equation, which is linear in the case of the Boltzmann Gibbs entropy. Indeed, you have the binary process associated to this uh, Fokker Planck equation. But I wonder in the nonlinear case, the, the question, be, uh, the situation becomes much tougher. And it's not clear to me in what sense these nonlinear Fokker Planck equations uh, describe a stochastic process. This is my question. Yeah, so th this, is, this is a really good question. Um, um, the difference it introduces is that it um, it um, transforms the uh, density to to um, an effective density, uh, intuitively speaking, right? So if we have uh, this uh, 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 diffusive term, which is uh, which is an f of p, an effective density uh, that can model the in, uh, the interaction between the particles in the same time and the same location, right? Um, and so um, I, I believe that there is so much work to be done. And, and I mean, there's a lot of wonderful work, but also it's so much work to be done uh, regarding connecting this microscopic description, which is this and the possible microscopic uh, rules that can lead to 
these nonlinear Fokker concatenations. And there are nice, really nice books uh, uh, about nonlinear Fokker concatenations and how they model different uh, uh, correlative systems. Um, but, uh, but it's a dif difficult question to relate these macroscopic uh, uh, aspects to the microscopic rules, so as the rules governing the dynamics. I don't know if no. I answered answer your question more or less, but... Uh, Yes, well, I, I know that there are right. some few examples, uh, not, not so many to the best of my, of hmm. my knowledge, but because you deal with so many nonlinearities, I was kind of curious about if there, there were so many uh, processes associated to them. But yes, well, I think it's, it's clear now. So thank you. So we have no time for questions. It's an interesting talk. I have also a question concerning, for example, fractional Fokker Planck equation and entropy and so, but there's no time for, for discussion at the moment. So I should I should close I should close this session and thank you all speakers again. So thank you. Thank you very much for your effort. And I wish you all of you uh, a fruitful conference still. So thank you, thank you very much for your attention and, and so. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very Thank much you. for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. So, uh, uh, excuse me, Michael, but yes. uh, I should, I should, um, uh, the, my system, my, my, my laptop stopped, suddenly stopped my activity <laughs> and I switch uh, on again. You see, so that's two yeah. minutes, three minutes. It's okay, uh, it's okay. I, uh, delay, so thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, support Bye. me. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.